Okay, let's start. <clears throat> so before I start my presentation, I have two news to share with you. A bad news and a good news. So bad news is Hugh Wood should have been here deliver this presentation with me together. But unfortunately, he couldn't make it because of some reason. But the good news is the presentation will be shorter than you expected, so that you have more time to talk and drink. OK, so let's start. My name is Yan Sun, and you can call me by my English name, Sunny. I'm from Beijing, China, and I work at SUSE as QE team lead. But today, I'm here on behalf of OpenSUSE Asia Committee to do this presentation and show our accomplishment of the OpenSUSE Asia Summit. Firstly, we will go over the journey of the OpenSUSE Asia Summit together and look at why it works well for 10 years in order to keep it running better. There is a song named 10 Years, sung by a famous singer, Ethan Chen. 10 years. What are the most impressive things for you from the past 10 years? Think about this question for a few moments. When I tried to answer this question, the Open Source Asia Summit came to my mind. To be honest, when we had the first Open Source Asia Summit in 2014, I couldn't imagine what the Open Source Asia Summit would look like after 10 years. But until now, it has been running for 10 years. Open source album is one of our traditions. I'm going to show you. It was handed over from one host to the next one during all summit. Each host pasted their photo in the album. When I opened the album, many memories came out. So let's set the clock back to 2011 and go over the journey of the Open Source Asia Summit together. In 2011, I attended the Open Source Conference in Nuremberg. This conference impressed me a lot because that's my first time to meet the community contributors in person. I was so proud of being a member of the community and co-working with them. In 2012, two colleagues and I were sponsored by GNOME and SUSE to join Guardac in Spain. There was a video to summarize the whole conference was shown at the closing session. I personally show in that video a very big photo. I was wondering why my photo was there since I'm not a pretty girl. But I draw my conclusion because in that conference, only a few people from Asia and I was the only Asian female. OK, we know GuardX stands for GNOME Users and Developers European Conference. European are definitely majority. However, I think Asians should be more active. So I made up my mind to promote open source upon my return. Before 2014, we only have a yearly open source conference in Europe and open source summit in North America. But we never have such conference and summit in Asia. So I think it does make a lot of sense to create open source Asia summit. Additionally, if people were comfortable to show up to the open source Asia summit, 
they will probably be more active to show up to the international conference and represent Asia. By talking to some open source community members, we submit the proposal to the board to host the first open source Asia summit. And our proposal got actively support from the board and the community. At that time, we didn't have much experience to host such summit. So there was a quite a lot of challenge during our preparation. We looked for local sponsorship, booked one new, and figured out all unexpected problems. There were many things to do every day. But if you ask me if I had thought of giving up, my answer would be no. Because at that period, I read a story from Steve Jobs. Steve said he stood in front of the mirror and asked himself, if this was to be the last day of my life, would I still want to do what I'm about to do? So I stood in front of a mirror and asked myself every day, if this was to be my last day of the life, would I still want to work on Open Source Asia Summit? And the answer was always yes. Through all our hard work, the first Open Source Asia Summit took place in Beijing in 2014. From that year, we have yearly Open Source Asia Summit, either online or offline, except for 2020 because of Corona-19. Here are the data of each year's summit. Last year, we had the first offline Open Source Asia Summit in Chongqing after Corona-19. We were so pleased to meet our community friends in person again. This summit took place in the University of uh, Chongqing University of the Post and Telecommunications. We usually chose university to host our summit. One reason was the student had a lot of passion on learning new stuff and embrace open source. And the other reason is they were eager to contribute as a volunteer. This model always works wherever they happened. From the first Open Source Asia Summit, we kick off a public competition was calling for logo design. We collect a proposal from public and everyone vote for their favorite logo to identify the winner. And the winning design will be used on that year's summit on all promotional staff. And the designer would receive a mysterious box as a reward. Here are the logo design proposal of each year. In 2014, Beijing, 2015, Taipei, 2016, Jakarta, 2017, Tokyo, 2018, we're back to Taipei again, 2019, Bali. As I said, 2020, we didn't have a summit, and 2021, we had an online Open Source Asia summit, also because of COVID-19, which was hosted by Indian team. 2020, still an online summit hosted by Open Source Asia Committee, and the last year in Chongqing. There were two intentions behind this active. One was for encouraging innovation, and the other was we want to show people there were many different types of contribution we could do for the community besides coding. As I said, I never imagined thought what the Open Source Asia Summit would look like when we had the first one. And I even didn't know if we will have the Open Source Asia Summit in 2015. 
So before the 10th Open Source Asia Summit this year, it's the right time for us to review the journey of Open Source Asia Summit and look at why it's running successfully for 10 years. Firstly, it was amazing that we have a great Open Source Asia Committee. Some members of the committee show in this picture, but some people are missing. <coughs> I am the only SUSE employee in this committee. We use our spare time to work on community, but everyone had a passion and a spirit on the stuff we are working on. We support each the host of the submit, but we have one rule, local is king. The local organizer have their freedom and the flexibility to decide what the Open Source Asia Summit would look like in their cities. For example, we sung the national anthem and the watch traditional dance in some opening session. I studied psychology two years ago, so I'm used to analyzing many scenarios based on psychology. If I were to analyze why the Open Source Asia Committee runs well, the coaction effect came to my mind. The coaction effect refers to a phenomenon whereby increased task performance comes about by mere presence of others doing the same task. The coaction effect emphasizes how parallel activity rather than direct competition or cooperation can impact individual behavior. For example, we had a committee staff sync meeting every Monday evening, 9 p.m. Beijing time. Whenever I feel I, I, I'm very tired and uh, won't join the meeting, or I always remember 9 p.m. in Beijing is 10 p.m. in Japan. Japan team never said it is too late for them to join the meeting, so there was no excuse for me to be absent from the meeting. When the questions were raised in our channel, everyone actively pick it up and share opinions. There was always a great teamwork in the Asian committee. Besides a good committee, community member is another very important factor to lead a successful summit. I interview many people in various of Asian activities of the open source about why do you love open source. Here are the top four answers. Firstly, there were a bundle of great and fun people in the community. Second, the community is full of fun. Thirdly, there are countless projects and technologies across countries, religions, and the genders in the community. And the last one is people are open for discussion and are treated fairly. Why are these feelings so important for people? And why are these feelings making people stick with the community? <coughs> Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a motivational theory in psychology, comprising of five-tier models of human needs. Often depicted by hierarchical levels within a pyramid. From the bottom of hierarchy upwards, the needs are physiological needs, safety needs, belonging needs and love needs, esteem needs, and self actualization. Actually, the previous four reasons mentioned in previous slides feed people's psychological needs and self-fulfillment needs. You probably ask, there are many things and tasks could feed people's this feeling. 
Is there anything special in the open source community? Let's look at William James' self-esteem equation. William James used a very simple formula to define self-esteem. Stating self-esteem equals success divided by pretensions. Self-esteem is how we believe, value, and perceive ourselves. Pretension, in this case, refers to our values, goals, and what we believe about our potential. I give you an example. If a person who play guitar would like to reach out to very professional level, this is very high pretensions. And in the end, he reached the goal. This is high success. His self-esteem level probably be at the same level as a person who play guitar just for fun. Because the later one had a lower success, but he also has lower pretension. In the open source community, a lot of people's work is not relevant to the open source, even not relevant to IT industry. They join the open source just because they love it. So these people are much more likely to have self-esteem in the community. Additionally, people in the community won't put a very high pretension upon others because we know the contribution in the community is not relevant to business or profit. So everyone's efforts are considered valuable, even the tiny one. When we notice that other people have done something, and we told him what they did well and how good they will feel about it. People who feel good about themselves produce good results. As I said, I never thought what the Open Source Asia Summit would look like after 10 years. So in this case, I would particularly thank you, these organizations and the people. Firstly, thank you to the Open Source Asia Committee members. Everyone's efforts are counted to lead a successful summit. Secondly, thank you to the open source community, especially to the open source board, who support us through all our summit and activities. Thirdly, thank you to the organization's sponsorship. They actually provide fundamental needs for our summit to make our summit running. Actually, they feed our basic needs in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Last, I would particularly thank Collie's personal sponsorship every year. We are deeply moved by his generosity. This year, the Open Source Asia Summit will happen in Tokyo, Japan. Calling for logo design and calling for proposal are working in process. Please feel free to submit your proposal and uh, visit events.opensource.org for more details. I would close my presentation with a very short story. More than one week ago, I was in Berlin and uh, delivered this presentation. I actively collect the feedback from audience in person after the meeting. One of the feedback I got from a person, he said, Sunny, we know you guys did a lot of work, put a lot of effort on the Open Source Asia Summit. So it will be better you put much more passion in your speech. OK, I totally agree with him. And I was thinking how to put much more passion in my speech. But today, just before I stand on this stage, I decided to follow my old way to deliver the presentation. 
because under my culture, life teach me have more passion and empathy in my heart to feel the people and the things around me, but face to this world more peacefully and calmly. So today, if you didn't see a lot of passion in my speech, but I hope you can feel our passion about Open Source Asia Summit. Thank you. So, any questions? Yes, do you need my mic? Uh, it's going to be repeated. Uh, on 2018, you had 1,400 people, right? Sorry? Uh, on 2018. Yeah, if you can go to the attendance slide. Year 2018, it was like shining in the table. It was like 1,400 people. How come? Did you join at first with some other conference? Or how did you manage to get 1,400 people? That's, that's very, very, very impressive. Thank you. I got your question. And give me a few seconds to roll back to the slides. This year, we co-host with Coast Cab and Gnome Asia. That's why we got more attendees. Thank you for the question. Any more? Simon. So, less of a question, more of a statement. Um, I have had the privilege of going to OpenSUSE Asia Summit to represent the board a number of times, and each time has been an amazing experience. I would highly encourage anyone who can to go at least once. And I'd also like to thank you, I know the local organising committees do a lot of work for each individual conference, but the Asia Summit team keeps consistently coming back every year and putting in a lot of work to get a new proposal, to make the event run smoothly. And so I'd like to say a big thank you to you and your team, because I have certainly been privileged enough to see the passion that you guys have for this event, and it's fantastic. Thank you very much, because your efforts are counted for our successful summit. Thank you for the feedback. If no more, we close the session. Thank you, everyone, being here. Oh, oh sorry. It's too early to say that. Uh, just one question. The, so anyone can participate on the logo contest? I suppose that. Yeah? Welcome. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Any more? Okay. No. Really, thank you for being here with me. We spent a good time together. Thank you.